thank you for our relationship with you. Thank you. It's, it's unique to every single person. That you're the God of everyone, but you're the God of one. And I thank you this morning. You will touch your people with your presence. Let them have a tangible taste of what God does and how much he loves his people. Thank you, God, for coming to this house. You could go everywhere, Lord, but you came here this morning. Thank you for coming. We worship you. We honor you. You are honored in this house. You are honored in this house. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. And everybody said, so be it. Amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of God. Amen. I love that you're all here, but... I'm glad he comes. <laughs> what would we do if he didn't come? Amen? Hallelujah. So we're going to talk this morning about finding uh, your place in the timing of God. That's kind of a continuation from last week. I'm so thankful that God ministers to you. You have no idea. <laughs> Maybe you do. It's kind of like when you see your kids get blessed in your house. Something that God does for him. I'm so happy God visited you today. He visited me, but I'm happy he visited you. And I know that you will be different from this day because every time God touches you, you have a different sound from then on. What he does can only be done by God. No man can do it. No man can fix what God can fix. No man can love you like God loves you. Jesus said, I'm a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He said, if your mama forgets you, I won't. He says, I just don't forget. He's faithful to the end. And when you leave this planet and you're laying it down or however you go, you will know he's, he's right there. You've, you've, you have eternal safety, which is much greater than earthly safety. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. God's present in your exit. He was there in your entrance, and he's there in between. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn to Romans 12, please? Hallelujah. Father, help me talk. Help me articulate what you once said this morning. In Jesus' name. Okay. This is a scripture for Paul writing to believers. I love Paul's life story because Paul used to arrange the death of Christians and the incarceration of Christians, and then he writes two-thirds of the New Testament almost that we preach to you today. You talk about a conversion. Amen. Doesn't that tell you something? When the devil lies to you and tells you you can't live your new life, remember Paul. Amen. Paul was a killer turned preacher turned give his life for the gospel. Loyal to the end. Faithful. When he made his commitment, he never switched. He might have had issues, but he never switched. And he wrote almost all of what this testament of what we preach. It's amazing when you have a conversion. If you've had a conversion, it's different. Now, I'm going to touch that for just a minute. If you had a salvation, what I call you got saved, but you didn't get converted, you need to go back and revisit your salvation. Because God, when he touches your life, you literally go the other way. You go the other way. Now, you might have all kind of issues going the other way because you still got a lot of baggage, but you're going the other way. And if you will hold out to the end, you will be saved from all your issues. You know, one of the best ways to keep your issues, issues is to not move, to stay where you're at and justify your position. But if you want the life God provided for you, you have to follow. Though none go with me, you'll be alone sometimes. I will follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. Everybody in here know that song? If you don't, you should. Look it up on YouTube and sing it. <laughs> do you do that? Do you, do you look up on YouTube and sing? I do it. I did it this morning. About five times. <laughs> Been up a long time today. I start putting it in as soon as I can for victory. For victory. A worshiper of God. Amen. I beseech you. I got to tell you what beseech means. We're going to start out right now. <laughs> Two words and we're already going to be talk about it. 
It says, ask urgently, fervently, to do something, implore, entreat. In other words, I'm doing all I can do so you'll listen. Brethren, this is, this is the people of God. This is us, right? By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In today's world, that seems extraordinary. But in Paul's mind, it was ordinary for you to give God your body while you're in it so he could do what he wants on this planet. You literally can't, I know you've heard me say this before, you can't do anything when you get evicted out of that thing. Whatever day it is for you, 120, whatever it is you, you got on your heart. All I'm telling you is when you get evicted, you can't do anything else for God. If you're going to do something for God, you've got to do it while you're wearing skin. Thank God you got some skin. You're in a body. Now, I have to ask you, what are you doing with your body? Only you know. Is it, is it bringing glory to God or is it fulfilling the lust of the flesh? And the lust of the flesh, the flesh, remember, if your flesh was any good, you could take it with you. It's not going. It has to stay here. You're going to leave it behind. Your flesh is to do what you tell it to do. And if you don't, it'll tell you what to do. Eat this, do this, do that, drink this, do that, go here, go on vacation, and it'll, and it'll never be satisfied. You'll need more money next month to go do some other things you think you need to go do. But something happens when you get satisfied with God. All those things begin to go strangely dim, as the song said. Did you know present has two meanings, present and present? I think that being, he's one of the meanings he's saying is you need to be present. Have you ever talked to somebody and they're not present? That's exhausting. You just quit in the middle of the conversation. You, just don't, rude, you don't do it rudely, but you just fade off because you don't want to offend them. But when somebody's not present and you're talking and you're looking in their lamps and you know they're not there, you kind of just want to quit talking. You just got to find a diplomatic way to stop. He's saying be present in where you are and present your bodies as a gift to God. Present is a gift. So you got to be present, you got to have be a present. You got to be be present and you got to be a present. That sounds like I'm repeating myself, but they're two things. You got to be there. If you ever work with people who aren't there, it's real hard to work with people who aren't there because every time you talk to them, they can't focus on you long enough to, to, to be a team. If you want to be a team, you got to be present. And everybody got to be present and understand the vision. You know, I know that uh, Habakkuk says, write the vision down, make it plain to those that may read it, may run with it. But if they're not there, you can write it down, you can put it on a wall, you can put it in neon. But if they aren't engaged in it, it doesn't have the same effect. It's just head knowledge. And it doesn't mean they will do the job whether you're at work or whether you're in the church or in your family. Okay. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Wow, you mean I got to use my body for the kingdom of God, which means I have to tell it what to do all the time. Amen. You have to tell your body what to do because it'll do whatever it wants. I just said that a minute ago. You have to tell it. So when you present your body, that means you have to be able to tell it what to do. A living sacrifice. In other words, while you're living, it's a sacrifice. How many of you would help somebody? And it was sacrificial. Amen. You, you're, you're making your body be used for something other than what you want it to be used for. You don't even want to use it for that. But you do it for the sake of somebody else. Holy, wow, and acceptable unto God, for this is your reasonable service. Holy means dedicated, consecrated to God or a religious purpose. How many of you, don't flinch, I don't want to know, I don't want to know, I don't want to know. <laughs> you know, you preach, there's a lot of things a preacher don't want to know. You might think they want to know everything, they don't want to know everything, trust me. Why do you want to know everything about everybody? It's terrible. <laughs> anyway, so holy means you've dedicated your life to the service of God. And I have found, I remember in the Catholic Church singing on a Thursday night when I, when 
They were having prayer meetings. I have decided to follow Jesus. And I can tell you what I knew about it that when I, when I sang it then isn't what I know about it now. But I still hear the song today. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. No, no, and go with me. Still I will follow. Now listen, the challenges for new believers or even young Christians, when you start to follow, your husband might not want to go with you. Your boyfriend might not want to go with you. Your mama might not want to go with you. Your dad might think you're crazy. When you start to follow Jesus, you really wake up everybody that's not. And you can't judge them. You just got to learn to follow him and, and not worry about what they say and not hold, him against, hold it against them. See, you're supposed to thank God that you finally learned a difference. Because, see, if you, there was a time when you lived, you didn't know the difference. And you were comfortable being around all those people that didn't want to do anything for God and never decided to. They were living for their own entertainment. Amen. Now, how many of you remember trying to decide whether you want to be with your friends and be entertained or you want to serve Jesus? I, I remember that walk all the time. It's a decision everybody makes on their own. And be not conformed to this world. Do you know when you want to conform something, what do you do to it? You apply pressure to it. See, when you're making clay, it's easy. You can see the thumbprints. But there's a, a system in the world that puts pressure on you as a Christian to conform you to the world. That's about probably what most of this is about, what we're doing right now. It's, the goal is to dominate you and, and put pressure on you Anyway, peer pressure, social pressure, family pressure, any kind of pressure that can shape you into another shape than God. But we're made in His image. We're not supposed to look like the world. We're supposed to look like God. And that's all done in your actions that come out of your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You, you really are who you are in your heart. I know people make themselves look good, and that's cool. I like bathing and looking good and smelling good. I think all that's great, don't you? <laughs> Hallelujah. I think you ought to be glad, you know, people take bath next to you, right? Amen. <laughs> Sounds funny, but it's true. So we all like that. But really, who you are on the inside is what really matters, the hidden man of the heart. So it says, be not conformed to this world, but transformed. How do you transform your life? I've watched people fall out under the power, you know, you know how they do clunk there they go but they still go live their old life I believe in the Holy Ghost power and people falling down but let me tell you something I learned something about God if you ask me if I got a clunk or a keep I'll take the keep I've decided I'm a keeper I want to keep the victory I want to keep the revelation I want to understand what I agreed to because then I can keep it and I could use it I believe in, I've watched people, I've laid hands on people, they fall down, and that's good, and it's okay. Don't ever be ashamed of it. God touches you. It's wonderful. But if you don't do something with, your, with who you are, it will be fruitless. We have laid hands on people, and they have gotten better, but they've never changed their life, and they still died. So what you do after the clunk is what you get. After the falling down under the power matters. Hallelujah. We've all seen Pentecostal churches. This is going to sound really bad because church, it's not just Pentecostal churches where people, they, they fall down on the Holy Ghost, but they sleep together. They fall down on the Holy Ghost to get a divorce. If, I mean, there's a million things go on that aren't right. So that isn't evidence of your character. That's evidence of God's power to try to change you and, and make, you, make you feel loved enough to have put you in another direction. But you have to decide if you're going to go in another direction. So be not conformed, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh-oh. Do you know you can have that old mindset no matter how much power you've experienced? If you don't be renewing your mind with the Word of God and it change your thoughts, you'll still have the same patterns and you'll hate Christianity because you don't think it works. I'm, I'm telling you this morning, in the name of Jesus, one revelation will change your whole life. One. You need a, a dozen's better, but one good one lets you have two good ones. If you never incorporate them, it doesn't matter how many you got. 
You can, I believe you should incorporate the one that God wants you to work on right now. And when you learn that and you work out salvation and finances with fear and trembling with God and you start to get some money in your account and you start to have a little bit of wealth, you start to understand how the kingdom works financially or healing. It doesn't matter what topic it is. If it's healing, it's the same thing. You work the healing until you, you get to know how it works. You don't hope it works. You know it's going to work. Because, see, when you get something in your heart, faith gets it in there, in there, and you have it before you have it. So that's when you know you got it. Ah, uh, can you follow that? It comes out of here, not out of here. People live out of here, have Christianity in their head, but they have a miserable life. In here, when it comes from here to here, it transforms what's around it. And that's not a mechanical faith. That's a believing heart that you can't beat it out of. They'd, if you went to kill them, they'd still die and still believe it. All these died in faith, it says in Hebrews, not believing, not, here, not having the promise, but they, they held on to the end because they know the promise is still true. Your experience doesn't negate God's power. God's power makes your experiences. If you're living by your experiences, you're living backwards. Think about it. If you're living by what you had in your emotions, you're living in the past. How can you live in the past and go forward? You have to be looking at something else. Hey, well, it ain't never going to change. Guess not. By his stripes, I'm healed. Go to about shy. I walk in divine health. Every organ in my body works right, Lord. In Jesus' name, you're going to help me with my diet, God. Help me get rid of all the bad foods. Give me a different desire to eat what makes my body healthy in the name of Jesus. And then you start eating it by faith. And you start getting rid of all the other stuff that's in the house by faith. You throw it away because it's going to have to cost you to go do it again. It costs you to go eat bad now. The house is empty of the bad food. So it costs you. If you want to go eat bad, it's going to cost you money. That sounds funny, but you know, that's how you train. You've got to train this thing. It won't, do, it won't do anything unless you want to tell it to. Conforming your life. To follow God is a conforming. Hallelujah. Be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. Prove means you're working it. You're working. No work, no, no deal. And no action steps, no deal. Prove what that is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. You ever try to train somebody? They gotta, you got to give them enough information. But guess who's got to go do the work so they can know how to do it when you're not around? They do. You can instruct them till the cows come home, and that's good, the cows come home. But they still got to go work it. And as they work it, they are literally supposed to come back and ask you questions at different stages when they run out of answers. But we can t I'm only going to say one line about this because I'm not teaching on the orphan spirit. But if you have an orphan spirit, you'll just run off and go try to do it on your own, but you won't come back for the rest of the instructions. And then you think it doesn't work, but it's really you don't want to ask, which is a whole other topic. You've heard me say, I really worry about people who don't ask questions. They scare me. Because I've had to ask so many questions. If you, if you bring something to me, even in the office, these guys know this. I probably ask them about eight questions before I, they tell me something. I ask eight, five, two, three, five more questions about what they told me. And then I think about it, go downstairs and come up. Might even ask a couple more before I do anything. So if I need eight, nine, ten pieces of information to make a decision so I don't mess up the place, how do people do it without asking? Ask he said, knock, ask, seek, knock. Humility asks. Always remember that. If you're not asking questions, examine yourself. It's not bad to go back to the person that told you the first step and you run into it and you just don't. It's, it's, a, it's actually a, a good heart of diligence that wants to make it come out right more than it wants to look good. That's why I always tell people, I don't care if we look good. I want to know we did the right thing. I really don't care. 
You'll look good. Trust me, you do the right thing, you have some success, you'll look all right. You won't have to try to look all right. It'll be noticeable that you got it done by somebody. Anyway, prove it. So you got to work it. You got to work it. That's your reasonable service. That's reasonable, not unreasonable. It's reasonable. There's a process of the brokenness to become a servant. I have talked about this so much over the years. I'm, sometimes I wonder about myself, but I was just telling Scott yesterday, I can't help it. That's what God gave me to teach. You know, you don't, you walk into your success by obedience. You don't walk in it by achievement or work. I watch people work, work, work. 20 years go by, work, work, work. It still never had nothing 20 years later. So obviously that's not enough. I would believe in working. I work. But I've learned to take orders when I work from God. And those orders, he's the best engineer. He's the best planner of anything that is going to be successful, which means you've got to talk to him every day. Have you ever gone to work? Did your boss tell you what to do every day? If you had a job, you know, didn't they tell you who, what, what, they didn't write notes or something to you? This is who you, you got to do. This is who you got to serve. This car is going to be delivered today. This is going to happen today. It's normal to have to get orders from daily from prayer. Amen. Luke 25. The kings of the, gent, the Gentiles, Gentiles are obviously the people that aren't God's people. They're all God's people in the end, but you get the point. Exercise lordship over them, and they exercise authority upon them and call it benefactors. But you shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be the younger, as the younger, and he that is chief as the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who sits at meat or the one that serves? Is it not that sits at meat, but I am among you as one that serves? Servant leadership is different. I think that the perception of people's understanding of leadership, they expect you almost to be dictatorial. And see, this is the difference. I want you to think about this for a minute. This is where the church needs to pick it up. Principles work in and out. Principles are principles. In the church, people look at you as if they want you to make all the decisions, and, and that's cool. You should have a say it. But your goal is to train them so they can function without you as Christians and ministry gifts and believers. You want them to learn. But see, they got to ask you questions long enough to get there. Trial and error, I mean, they can go out and do it at work if you have a business or whatever, but it sure makes a lot of work. It makes a lot of work. I've seen wrong parts hung on cars. I've seen things that, in business that don't work. I've seen people in church that never grow into what they're supposed to grow into because everybody runs off and does their own thing, even inside the dealership or the business, but nobody coordinates. We're a team. We're a collect. You've got to in interact with people when you're a team. They're called the praise team. I really believe their unity is one of the reasons that the presence comes. Not so much your unity. It starts with the team first. When the team's in unity, they get the presence, and you get to be in unity with them in the presence of God. But I, I, I promise you, if there was dissension up here, it probably would not be the same. So isn't that interesting? You'd think they have to be good musicians for the anointing to come, and I don't think it's even connected. I think it's about their heart toward one another and what their understanding of the team. I think the world is yet to see what the church can do if it would not be fragmented. But we're getting close. We're about to do it. Amen. We needed a good shakeup. We needed a good shakeup. Amen? Romans 12:3. We'll go back here. It says that uh, to think more soberly about yourself. I'm talking about winning. This, I'm talking to people who want to win. You know that, right? I'm, I'm not talking about protecting your territory and wanting to stay the same. I'm talking about somebody who's willing to change to win. I never want anything without making a change, never. Somebody had to change, and it was always me. See, I used to feel sorry for myself. Why do I got to? You ever done that? Why do I got to be all the Never had that problem? <laughs> Had to work through that problem. Hallelujah. For I say through the grace given to me. This, Paul's saying, I've got grace to talk to you like this. Given to me, to every man that is among you. We all have a measure of grace. This is why people have a question issues. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, 
but to think soberly according to God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. I, I believe this with my whole heart. Your humility comes from the engagement of what you know and seeing what you don't know. If you stay out and you judge everybody and you think you know what everybody ought to be doing and you don't engage yourself, you will think more highly of yourself than you ought. By the time you engage, you almost wonder if you're saved. You wonder if you know anything at all because you're trying to implement spiritual truth into this world and the world is trying to make you conform to it. You find out who you really are. You, stubbornness, you can stay out of the fight. You can think anything you want of yourself, how great you are and how dumb they are or whatever you think in there. But once you start to engage Look, I've said this about being in business. I, I love being in business. Everybody should be in business for a month or a year or something. Because when, you, when your income gets directly connected to what you do as a person, you'd be surprised what you don't know. And if you want to really stretch it, get in business for yourself 100% with your capital and watch how quickly you can learn. <laughs> you learn fast if you want to because your capital's at stake and you know you're on a time limit and when you run out of capital that door is going to close and it's going to say closed it changes how you think flexibility comes when you engage because you can't keep your stubborn rigid stuff in your life unless you never engage my God did you hear that you can engage here I'm going to go back to old talking you can be a remote control Christian, but never engage. So you never know who you really are. You never know where you're located. And being located is half the way of getting out. <laughs> 